Hello, friends. Welcome to the ATC Double Cut. My name is Michael Woods. In today's episode, this is going to be a little bit of a follow up of what we talked about on the last episode, which is light and temperature and whether the temperature based growth potential can be improved by adjusting for light or adding in a light adjustment or a photosynthetically active radiation adjustment because both photosynthetically active radiation and temperature affect growth. So why are we only using a growth potential that looks only at temperature? Well, um, this is this is something that I talked about in the last episode. And in the last episode, I said this, I'm, I'm going to play uh, a little clip from the last episode uh, and, and kind of highlight what uh, was going through my mind when I was writing this next blog post that's getting the double cut treatment today. I, I'm looking out the window now. I'm, I'm in Hokkaido, Japan. I'm looking out the window and there are piles of snow outside. And in fact, I'll, I'll calculate what the DLI is here. Uh, I'll find a, a, a nearby sensor and, and calculate the potential DLI and the actual DLI and, and maybe share that in the future. Um, the grass is not growing. The, the temperatures are below zero at uh, night. I, I've been here for about a week and the temperature has been below zero at night, every night, and it's been just above freezing, just above zero during the day. So that was the episode uh, clip from last time. And basically I was saying, um, even though it's March, even though the grass is not growing, even though the temperatures are below zero and the growth potential is zero, uh, there is plenty of light. And because there's plenty of light, the light can't be limiting, but the temperature is. So I, I was using that as an example of the case where I don't think it was useful to add a photosynthetically active radiation correction or adjustment to the growth potential. So I, I've been traveling uh, since I recorded that episode, and I just uh, had some time today to look up those photosynthetically active radiation from March 16th from uh, a nearby weather station. So this is in central uh, Hokkaido in northern Japan, uh, a little bit south of the city of Asahikawa, and, and that's where I was recording, and I looked up the photosynthetically active radiation for the Asahikawa JMA, Japan Meteorological Agency, weather station. So this is in a new post, and I'll put a direct, direct link to this in the show notes so that you can check out this chart, and you can check out these exact uh, numbers if you're interested in this type of thing. I show a picture, and, and that picture I call figure one, and this blog post has a title, an example of ample DLI. DLI stands for daily light integral, which is the photosynthetically active radiation that reaches the surface of the earth on a single square meter, which is 10.76 square feet. That's, that is the area. And that's what reaches the Earth's surface over the period of one day. That's called the daily light integral, and it's abbreviated as DLI. Figure one in this post has a caption, the snow-covered landscape of central Hokkaido in mid-March 2024 when the growth potential was zero, but the DLI was fine. And this image shows snow and trees and snow on tree branches and agricultural fields and snow on those agricultural fields and roofs of buildings with snow on them. There, There is not much grass growth happening here because the grass is dormant. I, I then put a link to that little clip that I just played. I said in a recent ADC, ATC double cut, Discussing light and temperature, I mentioned that I'd calculate potential DLI for the recording location, check the actual DLI for the recording location, and share that information. So I've looked that up and uh, put that information in a chart, and it turns out that at Asahikawa, which is a little bit north of where I was recording, 
the actual DLI on March 16th, when I recorded that episode, was 32.4 moles per square meter. The potential DLI was 39.6 moles per square meter. And I show I, I, I show that hourly of uh, the the sensor at the Asahikawa station uh, reports hourly solar radiation, global solar radiation measurements. So I can, I can uh, show this hourly so we can see how it goes through the day uh, with the first increment of solar radiation in the photosynthetically active wavelengths coming between the hours of 6 and 7 a.m., and the final small little amounts of twilight happening from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. on March the 16th. So this is, this is actually a lot of light. That's, that's, that's enough light to support good creeping bent grass growth in the summer. And actually, this is more light than the grass can actually use because um, the light for, let's see, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five, six. We've got six hours of the day um, where the light is over um, the, the, the saturation point for cool season grass. So there's actually more light than the grass can actually use because the intensity of the light at any one second is uh, beyond the light saturation point, meaning the grass, cool season grass can't really use it. So when you start looking into these numbers, um, I, I just find that in so many cases, the cool season grass is going to be just fine without an adjustment. So uh, I then added some text. I said, my assessment after checking data for a lot of places is that temperature generally plays a controlling role in how much the grass can grow. Light from the sun rarely provides a continuous limit on growth, especially on cool season grass growth in the same way. And I, uh, I also calculated the growth potential for this day, which is zero. I said, meanwhile, in all this glorious sunshine... And, I, and I'm saying that there's sunshine because the DLI was 32 and the potential was 39.6. So uh, that is uh, pretty, uh, that's like, what was it, 82%? Yeah, the, the DLI index was 0.82. So that's 82% of the possible, um, possible light. So that's like 18% restriction from clouds or 18% shade, um, 82% sunshine. And so I wrote, uh, in all this glorious sunshine, the high temperature on March 16th at this location was 3.8 degrees Celsius. And the low temperature was minus seven degrees Celsius with an average temperature of minus 1.3. That gives a C3 growth potential of zero. So the temperature here is completely restricting growth and the light is not only not restricting growth, um, it's, it's actually close to an ideal level for cool season grass. So um, because, uh, because the light rarely gets uh, to such an extreme that it would limit growth, and I, and I talked about this in a lot more detail on the last episode, so I'm not going to reiterate it so much here, other than just saying uh, light rarely changes so much that it will limit growth. And because of that, um, I use this as another example of my argument that temperature on its own actually works surprisingly well. Uh, I want to talk about one more post here. I'll, I'll put a direct link to this one too. And uh, if you haven't checked this out yet, this is a post called Breaking the Ice. And it is a link to the remarkable USGA green section record of the previous week. The previous week uh, has, it, it starts off with a podcast from Chris Tritabaugh that's really, really good. Uh, 
Chris is the golf course superintendent at Hazeltine National Golf Club. He is uh, going to be the host of, or, or that club is going to be the host of the U.S. Amateur Championship this year. And he talks about playability, getting the course ready to host that event and the type of playability that he is trying to produce for the members and and some of the maintenance practices that he utilizes to present the course with the best playability for the greatest number of days in the year. It's a really interesting approach to turf grass management. Um, uh, Chris has talked about it quite a bit over the past couple of years. I've tried to talk about it quite a bit over the last couple of years. Chris and I have talked about it together, both publicly and privately, over the last couple of years. And when I listened to this episode of the USGA Green Section podcast, um, it, it struck me that I thought Chris had explained this way of turf grass management particularly well in in this. Uh, I think the host, John Petrovsky, asked some really good questions that set Chris up well to explain things. And then uh, with practice and thought and, uh, and, and a clear mind and, and his usual good uh, e- explanatory speaking style, Chris was able to really explain this well. I, I just can't really recommend this podcast enough uh, if you're thinking about trying to optimize the playing conditions where you are and make sure you're doing enough work as well. So it's, it's about all of the things. It's about how much the grass grows, how much fertilizer to put, how to manage the organic matter, how to have good firm surfaces with good green speed, all, all kinds of stuff. Uh, it's, it's about quality of ball roll also. Uh, how you decide to make some management changes to improve the quality of the ball roll. So uh, I hope you'll listen to that. And then it, this wasn't like a, a the type of green section record that has, just has like one article you want to read or one, one link you want to click. This one was just one really interesting item after the other because the next item was a report from Oregon State University on research into frost damage, and they shared the results that showed some devastating damage when you put rollers or cart traffic on frosted turf. And I don't think that comes as any surprise, and I'm not sure why anyone would do that. I've never really advocated for that. I I don't advocate for doing maintenance work on frosted turf. I don't advocate for sending carts out on frosted turf, but what I do suggest is that regular golfing foot traffic on frosted turf does not cause the type of damage that warrants frost delays. So I understand that some people say, okay, my, uh, you know, the customers at my facility don't want to play on frosted turf. Fine then you don't really need to worry about frost delays. Just have frost delays. Um, It doesn't need to be an issue because the customers don't want to play. But what I think is so interesting is that foot traffic, golfing traffic on frosted turf doesn't cause severe damage. And so what they also found in this Oregon State study, foot traffic on frosted Poa Annua putting green turf caused absolutely no damage. Absolutely no damage. And that's visual assessment. That's also with a normalized differential vegetation index, I think, and DVI uh, sensor. They, they didn't detect any decline in turf grass quality from foot traffic, from golfing traffic on uh, a frosted Poa Annua putting green. That's an ongoing study. There may be some more results. I've been in Japan this week, and it's March. It's the end of the frost season. Uh, I saw a lot of bent grass greens this week that had absolutely no damage, and they've had a lot of foot traffic on on frost this winter. And and there are thousands of these greens uh, in this country. And and this is not the only part of the world 
where where this can be the case. So uh, I think creeping bent grass is even tougher than poa annua. So I um, I think uh, there's no reason to force traffic onto frosted turf if the golfers don't want to play. But if you're turning money away, saying, I'm not going to accept your money. I'm not going to allow you to play golf because I'm afraid that your foot traffic on my golf course while there's frost is going to damage the grass. I think you might be leaving some money uh, in somebody else's wallet. And you, you can obviously run a lot more rounds through on a winter day or on, on a day in the year when there's frost if you start the tee times earlier and don't have a frost delay. So um, that's, that's the point that I've been making uh, ever since I've been writing about this on the ATC website. And one of the posts, I, I, I put a little information block in this post. I said, uh, I've written quite a bit about frost delays and damage on turf in winter. See, for example, these posts, I, I listed six of them. Uh, so I, I do recommend that you read them if you're at all interested in this one with some nice photos and some nice calculations, uh, has the title of how to lose 120 million yen with frost delays, which at the time of writing, uh, with the exchange rate, that would be about $1 million. And you can read that post about why frost delays, uh, I, I calculate would have reduced revenue by about $1 million. And that's why um, we played a lot of traffic on frost. Uh, we, we played a lot of golf on frost in that one winter. And uh, the damage was a lot less than I expected. And that was only the second item on the green section record table of contents. The third item was a article about communication by the well-known writer and communicator, Pat Jones. And he wrote an article about communication and, and selling yourself and, and promoting yourself as a turfgrass manager. So that was a very good article. And then there's regional updates about light, about a new course at Band and Dunes, about aeration, uh, about timely advice, about if you suspect you might have winter damage. It's, it's never too early to grab a plug or grab a few plugs and bring them into a controlled environment where the conditions are suitable for growth. So you can very quickly check whether the grass is, um, whether, whether the grass is going to recover or whether it is probably not going to recover. So I, I recommend that for a lot of things. Sometimes people can't identify a weed at a really low cutting height. And I say, well, please just grow it out and let it get bigger leaves and let it go to seed. Once something goes to seed, you can really quickly identify what it is. Or you can certainly have a better chance of identifying something if you can see the seeds. And, and uh, I recommend that. I recommend that for off types. So many times on Bermuda grass greens, people aren't sure if they have off type or not. I'm like, just grow some plugs and stop mowing it. And you, you will eventually see that these plants have different growth habits. So you can, you can quickly see when you have an off type and that's quite useful to know. So, uh, I just thought that that was a particularly good green section record. And I realized, uh, I've just been writing a few follow-up blog posts to green section record articles. Uh, one about frequent soil testing where I took a different, um, I have a different idea about that and, and I'm sure that uh, it's better to test less frequently rather than more frequently if you actually want to apply fertilizer more efficiently. Um, and then, so, so I wrote about that in, in a couple weeks ago and then this ne very next episode of the green section record, I was writing about how I just couldn't believe how good it was just moving from one article to the next. Uh, and, and, and really I want to recommend Chris's podcast also. That was, that was really good. Um, also last week I was on Travis Shaddix's turf grass epistemology channel, and we talked about some research that I did at Cornell university when I was a graduate student, um, uh, about phosphorus, sorry, about potassium soil testing, uh, and sand root zones. 
uh, I'll put a direct link to that video and you can um, you can find that as a podcast or as a video on Travis's channel and that is going to be of interest to the people who are really uh, hardcore into soil testing and turf grass nutrition and turf grass science and that kind of stuff. So um, that is about all I have for this episode. Uh, I, I still have some more follow-up calculations to make about the uh, the combination of temperature and light, uh, but but I, I did want to make that real simple one first, uh, just for what happened on March 16th, on the day that I recorded that episode, and and I claimed that the light would be fine and the temperature would not, and I just wanted to share what those actual numbers were before I forgot or before it got too far away from that date and seasonally that wouldn't be so meaningful anymore. So thank you for listening. Uh, Thank you if you're watching this. I really appreciate everyone who is interested in these topics and who takes the time to listen to what I have to say. I will sign off now for ATC from Tokyo, Japan. I'm Michael Woods. Bye-bye.